writers, and welcome to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. We're your hosts. I'm Rachel, the Author Engagement Coordinator. And I'm Joni, Author Engagement Specialist at Kobo Writing Life. This week on the podcast, Joni and Steph spoke to bestselling author Lisa Tadeo. What did you guys talk about? We spoke about Lisa Tadeo's first novel, her most recent book, her first novel. A lot of listeners will be familiar with Lisa Tadeo. She wrote Three Women, which was a nonfiction book that was immediately successful. She got a lot of attention for that. She is a journalist who turned writer. She was really interesting to talk to. I loved the book. I feel like it's a book that you'll enjoy too, Rachel. It's very dark, very intense, but I really enjoyed reading it. We spoke to Lisa mostly about her writing process and her journey to publishing her writing career. And it's a little shorter than our usual ones, I think, but I think it was a great conversation and we hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So to kick it off, can you just tell our listeners a bit about yourself? I wrote a book called Three Women that was published in 2019. And prior to that, for which I spent 10 years researching, but during that time, I was also writing for Esquire magazine and publishing short stories. And now I have just, I'm coming out with my debut novel, Animal, in June. Awesome. So we know that Three Women hit the bestseller list immediately and was a huge, huge success. What was that like for you? You know, it was definitely less, it kind of, it was such a tornado that I didn't really get to experience it because I was doing so much publicity stuff. And I had no idea that any of that was going to happen. I thought I was writing a quiet book that, you know, that not a lot of people were going to read, frankly. And when more people read it than I expected, it was, it was a lot, but also there was so much going, going, going that I didn't, it's not like I was just sitting back and watching kind of it happen. I was like, you know, traveling and doing interviews and, and stuff. So, um, and, and continuing to write in general. So Yeah. So it wasn't, it's hard to say it was both very destabilizing and also my life was already destabilized because of everything that I was doing. So I don't know, it kind of canceled each other out. Yeah, definitely. So your new book animal is coming out in June. How did the 10 years that you spent researching three women, did that contribute at all to developing the protagonists in this book? Yeah. I mean, there's a, a good amount of things that were taken from my research in Three Women. There were a lot of stories that I wasn't able to tell because the people were scared about their stories being public. So I was able to use a lot of different components in Animal to create an amalgamation. But at the same time, I would say Joan, the main character, is just as much an amalgamation of, you know, people I've met through the book as she is of people I've met through my own personal life. It's kind of hard to separate the two. I would like to kind of go back a bit. So I read on your Instagram that your first short story was kind of published because an editor took a chance on you because you didn't have any experience. I was just wondering, can you tell us a bit about your like writing career and how you've become a success basically? Yeah. Well, I was short stories was always kind of what, you know, what I've wanted to do my whole life. I always used to read short stories at like the town pool, like you know, I would always go to like the, the, you know, they didn't, they weren't little free libraries back then, but it was like, I'm done reading this. I'm leaving it on the wet, (laughs) the wet banister of the pool. And what I really loved was how, uh, just how, how you could slip into a world so easily. And if you didn't totally love the world, you could slip into another one. So I love short stories. I was writing those my whole life. Probably like, I probably wrote short stories once a week all throughout my life. And then when I got into, when I graduated college and I wanted to work, you know, I wanted to be a working writer beyond publishing a a novel or or a work of nonfiction. I didn't, I, I wasn't really thinking about it that way. I was like, how do I make money while I, you know, while I, I started writing, I became an editorial assistant at, um, I think my first, my first real job was a golf magazine as an editorial assistant. And then from there, I wrote a note to do that's how that short story came to happen because he had read some of my fiction. And I said, I pitched all these like crazy ideas of like, you know, how to have sex in like just whatever Esquire type 
headline I could think of for back then. And he wrote back and he was like, hey, these are great, meaning, you know, these suck, but I'll find the right story for you, you know, because you seem to like fiction. So I'm going to, you know, see what I we can do to that angle. And then when Heath Ledger, unfortunately, passed away, he wrote to me that following morning and said, you know, because it was such a tragedy and it was so, it was kind of like, you know, this thing that everybody was just so taken by. And he asked me to kind of report on how it happened, but to fill in the rest with my imagination. So that was, that was my first thing. And I wouldn't say it was like success from there then on, but that's kind of, that definitely was where I felt like a real writer. How does it feel? I'm not really sure how to ask this, but when you're talking about taking something non-fictional and making it into a narrative, do you feel that you can be creative with that? Or do you feel kind of anxious about keeping things factual? When it came to the book, everything is a hundred percent factual. The book is pure nonfiction. When it comes to, you know, that Heath Ledger story or what Joyce Carol Oates has done with Marilyn Monroe or, you know, her book, Black Water, where she takes, you know, where, where anybody or what Curtis Sittenfeld doing like Rodham, you know, when you have stuff like that, there's a different sort of a thing. You have a public figure and you have information about the public figure, but, you know, there's obviously stuff you can't know. So you have to make that up. I think uh, not, you don't have to, but that's, you know, that's, that's one thing that people do with historical fiction, obviously for me with Heath Ledger, that's basically what I did with my book. I wasn't with three women. I wasn't doing that. I was telling factual stories. So even though I employed a lot of the, you know, the sort of things of fiction, which is to say using a lot of detail, and, and stuff like that. I didn't have any sort of ethical questions about it because, well, I mean, my ethical questions were telling these people's stories in this kind of raw a manner, but I didn't have any ethical questions about truth because it was all on the record. Okay. How did you find the switch from nonfiction to fiction? Was it fairly natural for you? Well, since I've been writing fiction predominantly, you know, my whole life it was more of a switch to go to nonfiction when I started writing for Esquire. Because I, after I wrote that short story for Esquire, I wrote mainly nonfiction for Esquire and New York Magazine, et cetera. So I've never found it challenging to go from one to the other. Can you tell our listeners a bit about like what Animal is about? Sure. Animal is about, well, it's about, it starts off with a woman who witnesses an act of violence in front of her and then leaves New York for LA to go find this other woman who has the sort of key to her traumatic childhood. But what it really was for me, so it's it's a little bit of like a road trip slash, you know, I mean, I don't know if road trip is the right word, but <laughs> there is a lot of driving. But I was um, say journey, maybe journey. Yeah, journey. She, Joan, the main character for me is is an exploration of what it's like to have been put upon sort of your whole life, and to have all these difficult things happen to you. How do you then? How are, are your actions judged by those around you who do not? know perhaps what has happened. So Joan is my look at, is my sort of like, here is the interior of this. Here is somebody who has made questionable decisions. And before you go and judge them, like this is what, this is how they got from there to here. Joni and I were discussing this earlier, but it was like, I read a lot of romance novels and it's always in books like that, when there's cheating involved, it's portrayed as a villain. But this kind of novel kind of opened my eyes to be like, no, there's always three different sides to anything going on. And we nearly mm-hmm. need to think about that. So it was really interesting to read that since I heavily read that all the time. And I don't know why, you know, like, I don't know why I'm always like, oh, cheating is bad, but it's like, no, there's more stuff going on. And I think I was really interesting to see that portrayed in a book for the first time for me. Oh, cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, I think my interest in general lies in the sort of the middle ground um, and like the nuance of what, you know, because I think, I think so many of us can, you know, I mean, the easiest example I can give is like before we had our kid who's now six, my husband and I would, you know, do what every other parent, like non-parent does and look at kids like 
you know, at the restaurants, watching TV on like phones. And we'd be like, oh my God, we're never going to do that. And then, you know, cut to six months later and it's like Daniel Tiger is like over here and we're drinking wine and we're so psyched. And, you know, I just, I think with cheating, that happens a lot. And I'm not, that's not to say that I'm like defending cheating or infidelity or anything. It's not about defending that stuff. It's more so about, I'm just interested in, I'm not interested in saying it's fine to do this. I'm interested in saying, look, this person did this. Here's why, here's where they were coming from. Here's the sort of full story behind it. So I'm just intrigued by the full story of something. And then I'm intrigued by how our reactions might then differ. Something else that we were chatting about earlier is the presence of food in the novel. And Steph and I are both have Italian parents. And so that was very resonant. Um, I'm very, very familiar. (laughs) And just the association with, with pleasure and how important to you was that was the presence of food as a backdrop? Huge. I mean, food is a big part of my life. It's a big, it's just a big part of everything. I grew up, you know, also in an Italian household, although probably not like, probably not as food centric as, as some others. For me, I think like from an early age, I, um, I kind of wanted to experiment with like sushi and, you know, other things. And I've just always been so intrigued by flavor and my favorite thing to do or was before the pandemic was going out to new restaurants and like just trying new food. And so it's really important to me. I just, I think food sets a scene in a really big way. So we recently talked to a stylist kind of about the importance of clothes in a narrative. And me and Joni are now hyper aware of that, I think, when we're reading or like watching something now. Did you consider clothes when you're crafting your characters? Because what stuck out to me was the white dress that her mother wore and like kind of the implications of that. Do do you think of clothes as further your storyline when you pick them out? Yeah, absolutely. I think every detail of any sort of, of any kind of a situation, like if you the more detail you have about the way something looks, smells, and feels, just the more that you are in it. So for me, I clothes and food, really clothes and food and like water. I love like oceans and pools. I think having uh, that stuff always appears in my fiction and nonfiction because if I'm reading and if I'm, you know, doing something about a subject, my interest is naturally going to lot like be in those areas. So even if a subject of mine is not interested in food. I'm st- there's still something interesting about why is she not interested in food? You know, like what, it's like, what did you eat? Oh, I don't know. Something with like chicken. It's like, well, what, like I'm, I think that that, that food and clothes, it's just anything that someone gets to make a decision with. I mean, some people can't make decisions on those things, but for those of us who do and can, it's interesting. Like what do you decide to wear and eat that day and why? Was there anything in particular that was inspirational for you when writing Animal? Inspirational, like? Like in terms of, I feel like it's relatively new to talk some of the themes that you talk about, like female rage and pleasure and how those can be tied up in some ways. And I, I, but I think we're seeing that a little bit more in fiction now, like I'm trying to think of examples, but the power or I just think it's something that's being discussed more. And I wondered if that there was a particular writer or storyline that had inspired you with this? No, nothing in particular. I mean, I think I'm nothing new. I mean, I'm really, I think Natalia Ginsburg was probably a really huge inspiration for the book. I mean, and it's somebody that I've been reading and read for a long time. So I don't know how, but she's a big, you know, she, she's, I don't know when she passed away, but she's not a new, she's by no means a new, a new influence, but that's probably the biggest one. So I also noticed that your previous book, Three Women, is, is going to be adapted into a TV show. And I think you are going to be involved in the writing process of that. Yes, I'm the creator. Have you started that? Yeah, we just handed in the 10th episode. Ah. So we're done. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. We're, I think, going to go into sort of casting and, and stuff like that next. But yeah, it's pretty much, it's it's done in terms of the pre part of it. Did you find it weird to adapt a novel into or like how did that kind of process work hard I mean I've already adapted I've already been working I adapted one of my short stories and I was in development at Netflix 
so I've been doing other TV stuff and I'm, I'm doing a lot of other TV stuff besides that. So it's, there's been a lot, so it's not like that's the first thing I will say that it's the most challenging of the things that I've done because it was a woven narrative, you know, three unconnected people basically. So there were definitely questions and challenges as to, as to how to best adapt it for TV. So I did find it challenging more so than most things I've done in the TV scope, which has not been much, but I I do have some experience. Do you have any idea when that'll be aired? I guess it's still a while away. Yeah. I mean, they probably will be shooting it in the next couple of months. So I don't know. I don't know. I would assume sometime in 2022. Awesome. And what can readers expect from you next? Do you have anything upcoming? My collection of short stories will follow Animal probably sometime next year. And then I also just submitted a new nonfiction idea um, for another book. So that is, yeah. So a lot of things, I guess. I've been kind of nonstop working with this like kind of hope that that I'll get to this end point. <laughs> And I'll be like, okay, now I'm done. But that's it, the opposite has happened. So, but yeah, no, I've been doing a lot and it's been really exciting too. And it's been, you know, the pandemic has been really awful for a number of things. But in terms of work, I think that a lot of writers and other types of artists who do their work at home have been lucky in the sense that they can continue to have done it. And I've had more sort of freedom to do that. So I, I'm, I feel that there's a silver lining in that cloud. Definitely. What's it like? I don't know how open things are where you are, but normally when you're launching a book, not in a pandemic, you'd presumably doing, be doing in-person readings and events and that kind of thing. How is Animal, how's the launch of that going to be? You know, I don't, I don't exactly know. I have a lot of Zoom events planned with the sort of understanding that they could switch to live if, you know, things work out. But no, I mean, we've been finding sort of interesting things to do, like, events that involve kind of partners and like doing like eating things and drinking things with the people while we're doing we're kind of like my goal is to make it be fun because I feel you know we've all been pretty zoomed out and you know I think that so I I don't I don't know exactly how it's gonna look but but so far it feels like there might be some hope to have some travel in the future and, and stuff like that. Let's hope. And I wanted to ask also, how involved are you in the publicity and marketing side of things? Because I think we have a sense in the indie world that this is kind of taken care of by the publisher. And I think that that is no longer really the case. How much is of that? I mean, the publisher does a lot. You know, I'm lucky to be working with the team at at Avid Reader at Simon & Schuster has been super. They're really just, you know, they're a fairly new imprint at a fairly large house and they are very motivated to kind of do special things and they've created like tote bags for the book and they've been doing a lot of great stuff. So I'm involved in the sense that I like, I have ideas and I, you know, I like being a part of it, but they do do a lot. I was wondering since you kind of have been able to write in different genres and stuff like that, I'm wondering if you would have any advice since we have both established writers that listen and also new authors. Do you have any advice to a writer trying to maybe start their career already pretty established and trying to like make it to the next step or like worried about trying new things? Do you have any advice to writers or maybe best advice that you've ever heard? Well, I mean, I think, and this is more of a sort of writing for an outlet advice rather than like writing a book, but the best advice that I got was, and this is how I sort of got hooked up with the editor in chief of Esquire Someone said to me that you should always call editors, editor in chief, like just start at the top kind of thing, like first thing in the morning on like a Monday or a Tuesday or whatever, because, and first thing meaning like before nine, like eight or seven, because the sort of the motivated, the people who kind of are in charge of, of their world in a certain way and hold themselves in a certain way will be there answering their own phones instead of their assistants at that time. And just kind of formally just be bold and introduce yourself and say, I want to do this. That's really that. And the other big advice that I give to everyone that, I mean, like, you know, there's a lot to be said for editing your work and being, you know, and really making sure you don't have, you know, clunky, whatever, and definitely no misspellings and stuff like that. Because I think that can be really disrespectful to your reader, but really send it out. Like at a certain point, like just it, just send it out, just do the scary thing 
and hit send. And, you know, like it, there's always I think there's this ideal that like, oh, there's this perfect way that this story or this play or this poem can be. But there is no perfect way. I mean, you could change it and, and fix it forever. So at least that's how that's what I feel. So just send it out. Get it done. Take the scary step. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you join like writers groups or do you have like a close circle of friends that you share work with? No, I don't. I mean, I have writer friends and I I'm, I get more by the day sort of as I have like more into this role, which has been so, which has been one of the most amazing things about my book being read widely, like just meeting, getting to meet people that I've always found inspiring and et cetera. But no, I don't share stuff. Sometimes I'll ask my husband who I work with on a lot of things to read stuff, but even him, like at the end of the day, I am writing something for myself. And then after myself, I'm writing it for the editor or whomever who's looking at it. So I write it with that person in mind and, or or rather with myself and my, my sort of audience in mind. But then the only person that I really, it's like my husband, let's say, whose opinion I value still might say, Oh, you know what? You can do better on this, but I'm like, Oh wait, no, I actually think this is great. I send it to the person that is going to be either accepting it or getting or paying me for it or whatever it might be. And it's really their opinion that matters. So like, I don't find so much use in having like, I kind of, I said, no, I don't, I don't have a group where I sort of share stuff. And then our favorite question to ask people is what have you been loving lately? Any book, movie, TV show? I just started reading Secret Lives of Church Ladies. I believe that's the title. I've also been reading Diary of a Young Naturalist, which is a beautiful nonfiction book. This young, like Irish teenager wrote it. It's absolutely stunning. And Luster, I, I read fairly recently. It was the last thing that I, that I read that I was just like, oh my, my God, you know, like this is, this is a huge talent. And George Saunders is a swim or a puddle in the rain or swim in the puddle, something that, you know, his book about the Russian short story masters. I know Lester got a lot of chatter at Kobo. I haven't read it yet, but um, it's one of those ones that was bounced around. It's great. And you should try to have her Raven Leilani on if you guys, she's just a, a one we've done an event together. Um, she's just brilliant. Uh, I think she's, I just think she's a huge new talent just massive. That's awesome. Good to know. And where can listeners find you online? I am on Instagram at Lisa D. Tadeo. And then just again, when does Animal release? June 8th. June 8th. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. We will have links to Lisa's books on our show notes. And if you're enjoying this podcast, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. For more tips for growing your self-publishing business, head to kobowritinglife.com and be sure to follow us on socials. We are at Kobo Writing Life on Twitter and Facebook and at kobo.writing.life on Instagram. This episode was produced by Rachel Wharton and Joni DiPlacido. Stephanie McGrath was the co-host. Editing is by Kelly Robotham. Music is provided by Tearjerker. And huge thanks to Lisa Tadeo for being a guest on the episode. If you're ready to start your writing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing. <laughs>